Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really proud of this guy. He's an amazing man, a great friend, a great husband, father, and we're just really, really lucky and very fortunate to have Joe here tonight to uh, share some things that, Joe, I don't think you've ever talked about a lot of these things in public. So we carry tow missiles, Hellfire missiles, 2.75 inch rockets, and the gun on the front is 20 millimeter, and we're shooting uh, HEI, which is high explosive incendiary. So the, each bullet not only explodes, but it throws little white phosphorus particles all over the place that will melt through steel. So if one of those 20 millimeter rounds lands within about 15 feet of it, you're probably getting fragged or something. Yeah, tow and Hellfire missiles are anti-tank missiles. They, they, are designed, they were originally designed to blow up tanks. But we use them to blow up Nissan and Toyota trucks. <laughs> see, the, see the gun in the back? That's a tow missile. He had a, 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 a dead mounted turret gun. See the tube and the 45? That's big, that's like a makeshift uh, rocket or mortar launcher that they had out in the desert. That's why he's shooting it. It's just like an open tube. The Marine Corps went back to Iraq in early 04 after they'd been gone for six months. The Army had stayed, Air Force was still there, minimal amount of force was there really, and the insurgency was only starting to brew up, you know. You were getting some tidbits on the news about an IED here, they were just starting to figure out the IED thing. Um, a helicopter had been shot down recently before we showed up. Um, so it was only starting to percolate when the Marine Corps went back. Um, I've got a pointer here, but it doesn't, it's not working on the TV, but Iraq is about the size of the state of Ohio. And here's Baghdad and Fallujah just to the west of it. So if you drew a line like up to Baghdad, Baghdad towards Syria and down from Baghdad towards Saudi Arabia, that western third or western fourth of Iraq is known as the Al Anbar province, and it contains Fallujah and Ramadi, and a highway that runs straight out through Jordan. That was the Marine Corps' area of operations when we went back to Iraq. So, this is what I did for seven months. We ran 24 hour operations, seven days a week, seven months straight. No weekends, no holidays. No break, never stopped. So you as an individual might get a, a day where you weren't on the flight schedule about every seven or eight days. Like I said before, the ideal team was a Cobra and a Huey. We had a lot less Hueys, so sometimes it would be two Cobras or sometimes one Cobra, one Huey. Um, the insurgents quickly figured out not to shoot at the skinny helicopters. <laughs> However, sometimes that lesson had to be relearned. And they would shoot and then run, and sometimes they might hide in their mud hut, and we might see them, we might not. But if we saw them, then... <laughs> Too bad. Don't do that again. So... I was a major back in 04. I retired as a lieutenant colonel. Um, ironically enough, when all this happened, I was working at McCursick over where Richard Gabauri is. I had an admin job because I'd been furloughed from the airlines. I came back on active duty. And uh, they started mobilizing reserve squadrons. And I, I'd been flying in the reserve, so I was still current. And uh, I called up the reserve squadron in California and said, hey, man, you guys need extra Cobra pilots. And they are like, yeah, sure. So I. A week or so later, I was on an airplane out to California uh, to go to Iraq. What did we do in Iraq? We had three main missions. CASVAC Medevac, which is casualty evacuation, medical evacuation. We would escort the Army medical helicopters, the ones with the big white cross, big red and white crosses on the side. Or we would escort the CASVAC CH-46s, the frogs. Um, we would provide close air support to the Marines on the ground. And we would do a lot of convoy escort. Almost all the time, if we were escorting a convoy, they, they never came under fire. Um, we did, you were our best friend. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
We were your best friends. Thank you for that. So, <laughs> so yeah, when the Cobra gun is shooting, those big, those big uh, brass casings, they're just dropping out the bottom onto the ground. So if, you, if you're flying over friendlies when you're shooting the gun, you get hit on the head, head with the brass round, so it's just right <laughs> <laughs> And they hurt. I mean, those things were like probably, at this time, there were, there were people dying in Iraq every day. Not a lot, you know, but again, <laughs> you only need one. You know, um, and I think Vietnam was 100 a day at times, you know. Um, onesies and twosies almost every day were, were dying. Sometimes several or a dozen or two in one day would get killed. So it really made you question your, your faith and your and fate and luck. And you, you just tried not to think about it that much. And there'd be a random rocket land inside the perimeter of the airfield. And even if it wasn't close, it was really loud. And uh, on the right, uh, that's Doogie, and on the left, that's uh, Itchy. Yeah, they they always flew together, and so they were getting ready to brief for their flight, and they're sitting on the cot there, and uh, Doogie was sitting right where the hole in the cot is, and Itchy comes up and goes, "Hey man, scoot down." Right as Doogie scoots down, one of those 122 millimeter rockets lands like on their side of our flight line, and one little piece of shrapnel goes. All the way across, right as he moves down, it goes right where his head was. And it, it hits the concrete, hits the concrete wall right there. Bounces off the concrete, goes through the cot. See where it put a hole in the cot, and kind of goes tink 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 on, by his on the by his feet. And he he's holding the piece of shrapnel in his right hand. See it, a little black piece. So if if Itchy had had walked up to him a second late, he would have killed him twice. <laughs> 1972 Huey, low miles. John Taylor, quite the character. He's originally from Kansas City. He was a Northwest pilot. He was like 50 or 51, which that's how old I am now. But that, back then it seemed really old. He was like the oldest guy in the squadron, of course. Um, but he's a, he was a, a KU grad. Um, I kind of got a little ahead of myself. Um, my family's originally from Indiana, but when we moved here, uh, I started the seventh grade. So I'm kind of the only one in my family that's from Kansas City. I went to Nallwood Junior High, Shawnee Mission South High School, and graduated from the University of Kansas. And I went into the PLC program, between leaders class, had an air contract, got commissioned on graduation day from KU, and then went off to the basic school and flight school and everything else. So. We figured out that John Taylor and Chris Scharf, Chris went to Nallwood and Shawnee Mission South and KU also. He was like a year younger than me. So we, we knew each other, but we didn't really, we weren't like real good friends or anything. All three of us are KU grads, we're in the same squadron, so we went out and took this pick. And notice, like over here, you can see the, the Hellfire missiles and the rockets on the Cobra. So, so I sent one of these pictures home and it got passed around and then it got put on the KU website. Uh, notice how they cropped the missiles, so you can't see the missiles in this PLC. But uh, I just noticed this last night when I was looking at the brief. It, here I am on the KU website, and it's talking about the honor roll. That's really the only time I ever got any kind of recognition at KU. <laughs> this is a picture in the ready room taken from the other side of the previous picture. April 4th. After this day, everything changed for us. This was when the Marines were going out into town and Fallujah 1 was about to kick off. And we're briefing this up and we're like, oh, let's, uh, okay, let's, let's see what happens. And then it was like kicking a hornet's nest the next day and it was on like Donkey Kong for like three weeks. And there's Dave Green up there in the top left uh, next to the guy drinking out of the water bottle. You can see me kind of right there in the middle. I don't remember if it's Mobile or Michigan, but this is the highway that runs right through the middle of Fallujah. Those contractors were drive, driving down this road and they got down to the other end where the, where the bridge is before you cross the river. And they got jumped by a bunch of locals and they burned, they burned the Suburbans and their, and their uh, SUVs, dragged their bodies through the street, hung a couple of them up from the bridge. A, some of you may remember that. That's kind of what kicked Fallujah off, you know, it's like, oh yeah, we're going to do something set this up a little bit. This is a Hellfire shot. 
our lead aircraft is supposed to is supposed to be his Hellfire shot, but as dash as a good dash two, I'm supposed to be ready to assume the Hellfire shot if something goes wrong with his equipment. And in this case, it did. So you, you can you might be able to hear it, you might not. But he's like uh, zero two, you got the shot, and boom, we were on it and took the shot. So this is for all you Boy Scouts out there. Always be prepared because it's supposed to be his shot, but we were ready and then we, we were able to take the shot ourselves. I think it was in before that, right? Zero two, you got the shot. That's my voice. I got it here cleared hot, and then I can press the button. There it goes. Now I don't know where it's going to land because it, this is on the nice. this is on the forward air controller's laser. So in this case, we launch our Hellfire missile laser guided. Once it leaves our, our aircraft, we don't have control over it anymore. He's got it on his laser spot, and so he picked the building he wanted. We got the symbology. He says cleared hot. We launch it. This is Fallujah. The, the audio or the uh, video quality is not great, but you get the idea. The, the lead dot is, is a Cobra. That's our CO that's in that aircraft. And then the Dash 2 aircraft behind him is a Huey. So this is a perfect example of why in the urban environment, one Cobra, one Huey works really well. So what you're gonna see, or you, you're gonna hear a pop, 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 which is AK-47s are shooting at the Cobra. And then you're gonna see some sparks fly up at the Cobra. They launched an RPG at the Cobra and missed. And immediately after the RPG comes up, you're gonna see tracers coming out of the Huey and you're gonna hear that minigun. You're gonna hear that But the comical part is to listen to the Marines. The Marines on the ground are filming this with their personal video camera. They're in Fallujah and they just happen to be filming this when it happened. And the Marines on the ground are like, Oh, I just shot an RPG at the damn Cobra. And then you see the minigun open up and they're like, oh, you're done, you're done. It's great. <laughs> so it, the audio is like, you know, important in this case. AK, RPG, oh. minigun. Sam Lee on the far left, um, uh, Sam Lee, call sign Finkel. Uh, a few years later, uh, he had left our squad or he went out to California and uh, one night he was in a flight of like six helicopters and uh, uh, Coast Guard C-130 um, came through the formation about 500 feet off the water of Cal close to California and the right wing of the, of the C-130 hit his Cobra. It was just a massive fireball. So they never, they never really found any of them. Um, so him and his co-pilot, and there were there were nine crew members on the Coast Guard C-130 um, in that midair. So I call this my 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 greatest day in Iraq. So we show up on station. Cobra just got shot down. The fact is trying to get Pete. There's Harriers in the stack and F-16s in the stack. We show up. The fact's trying to get them to drop a bomb on a particular building. He can't get them. He doesn't have a laser designator. He can't get them to see the building, but I see it. And we jump in, you know, I say, you gotta get the fight. So like, we jump in on the radios and say, we got the building. And the fact's like, okay, can you put a toe into it? Nope. And so that's what you'll see when we start the video. Then we come back around and he's trying to talk an F-16 on a different warehouse building, guy can't see it. You know, he's at 20,000 feet, he can't see it, can't see it. And, uh, and I, we jump in and we say, we see the building. Oh, can you laser designate for his 500 pound bomb that we're gonna drop on that building? Yeah, we can do that. So that's what we did. And then I got, I came back around and I got, bought, I got a picture of the hole my toe put in the building and I got a picture of the 500 pound bomb, the hole of the 500 pound bomb, but now, this video is kind of screwed up. I had to like slow it down to get it to clear up. So a lot of it's kind of, the good parts are slow motion, which is okay. 
but that's why it kind of looks different. So it starts with toe on the wire, so it's already out there in front of you. See the little white dot? So remember that little horizontal window in this building. So there's guys in that building shooting at the Marines over here. And that they could not talk the fixed wing onto that building. So we see it. That little white dot is the missile. It works great because it rings their bell, but it doesn't bother the neighbors. I'm holding it in there. I'm holding it in there. Direct hit. Then he says, Hey, Mr. Harrier, do you see the dust cloud? Yeah? Can you drop a bomb on it now? So we come around, and I'm going to watch him drop a bomb on the building that I just put a toe into just to finish it off, right? When the tow missile hit, the guys quit firing at the Marines. So I'm watching, oh, just a little bit outside. He should have hit it where my crosshairs were. I, I wasn't, I was just filming. I wasn't playing a part where the bomb dropped. But everybody in Fallujah was bad at that point. It doesn't really matter. But, but he did miss. But the, notice the dust cloud had kind of cleared by the time he rolled in. So there's only so much to get. There's the warehouse building. Laser's on. And it'll clear up here and slow down. You, you hear me? I'm like, where is he at? Because we're like, Granted, the Cobra just got shot down, and now we're hanging ourselves out. And I've got a laser on that building, and an F-16s. It takes a long time for a bomb to drop from 20,000 feet when your ass is hanging out there. It takes like 22, 23 seconds. So you're the forward air controller at that point? No, the forward air controller's on the ground. Oh, yeah. We're, with, your, with your missile. Your we're, we're designating. Yeah. So my laser's on that side of that warehouse building. There it is. That's a 500 pound bomb. A lot bigger than the little missiles we carry. So it works real well. And as soon as that bomb hit, the guys in the building that were shooting at the Marines quit shooting at the Marines. So then I was able to see the, see the hole. So I was able to get a good BDA on that, on that building. And then, after we hit the building with the tow, and after we designated the 500 pounder on that warehouse building, the fight was over for the day. All the college shooting stopped, everybody went home. So I felt like that was, that was my greatest day because we kind of jumped in with the fact who happened to be a Cobra pilot and kind of made things happen. And then when we, when we went away, the fight was over. See, the, there's the building with the tow. See the horizontal window, and then there's the whole that the, it made the size of the concrete building. So doesn't completely destroy it, doesn't mess up the neighbor's house, but it totally ruins the guy's day on the inside of the building. And it's originally a, an anti-tank weapon. Just worked quite well for buildings and other things. So this is Lieutenant Colonel David Green, call sign Rhino. He was a maintenance officer for our squadron. I was flying with him on July 28, 2004, and we were on our third mission of the day. We were escorting a couple frogs back from a Kazovac mission. They had angels on board. Um, angels is the term that they use when someone has died. So they had some guys that had been killed on board. We picked them up in Ramadi on the way back to TQ. The frogs come up on the radio and say, hey, the DASC is trying to get a hold of you. They want you to go back to Ramadi for a different mission. So we switch the radio over to the DASC. We go turn around. They're about back to TQ anyways. We, so two Cobras go back to Ramadi. And uh, we start talking with 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, 2-4 on the ground. And it's a Marine patrol on the east side of town. And they're taking some sniper fire from one of the buildings. He wants to come in and take a look. Broad daylight, like one o'clock in the afternoon. We we move in kind of close. The CO passes us the lead because he's having radio problems. So now we're in the lead. We move in. I'm up front. I'm down in the scope, looking, trying to. A bunch of concrete buildings all look the same. I'm not going to pick a guy out of a window or whatever unless he was being obvious. So I come up out of it. We we make a run and I come up out of the scope. 
and I say, yeah, I don't have, I'm not seeing anything. And he's like, all right, coming left. So he rolls, rolls the aircraft left. He's flying in the back. And right as he rolls left, it sounded like somebody came up side of the aircraft and smacked it with a baseball bat. Like, bam! And, you know, of course, I was like, what was that? And, you know, I'm looking around. I don't see anything. And so the aircraft rolls left. And after we get hit, it kind of kind of flattens out and kind of starts to go straight again and descending. And I say, hey, man, we're getting close to the edge of the town. We need to come left. And there's power lines coming up. And he doesn't say anything. And then right about that time, the master caution goes up. Ding, 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 ding. And I look down, I stop the master caution. I see the number one engine dog going, we've just lost our, so I say, hey, we just lost our left engine. And we're descending and kind of half turning and there's power lines coming up. And I'm like, what the heck? So I grab the controls, my stick's over here. So I grab the controls and kind of pull us up a little bit and turn us away from the town. And I get away from the town, I'm like, and I move the pedals back and forth, and I'm thinking, okay, he, it's just kind of starting to dawn on me that it's been 30, set, 30, 40 seconds now, and he hasn't said anything. And I'm like, did my helmet come unplugged, or what's going on? So I'm playing away from the town, I'm out of danger at this point, and so I'm like, hmm, okay. So I turn around, and absolutely horrified. It looked like somebody had taken a, a bucket of red paint and just threw it all inside the canopy, down both sides, all the way across the top. And, and I, you know, I turn around once, and I, and I could see a hole in the, in the canopy right up here. Like, like I could probably like stick my finger in it. From, like, if I was sitting, I could probably about stick my finger in the hole. So I turn around, and I'm like, I didn't even know what to think. Um, and so I look back down. We're flying OK on one engine. We're fully loaded with ordnance, so I'm contemplating jettison all the ordnance, but I'm like, I don't know what kind of battle damage we got. If I jettison one side and the other side didn't come off, now I'm lopsided. And so I come on the radio and I, 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 call, the, I call Tramp, the CEO, I say, Tramp, get up here. Uh, I'm single engine, and I think I'm single pilot. And I, I start heading back towards TQ. And uh, he comes up and joins on us. He comes on the radio and goes, yeah, I can confirm you're definitely uh, single pilot. This is our aircraft. The Marines had already kind of taken us apart, but, and they had cleaned the aircraft. This is the next day. Um, so who's been in the first class section of United Airlines holding M4? <laughs> Good, we, we all carried all our weapons on the airplane, weapons free. No ammunition, just the weapons. Coming home is always the best thing. This picture was actually when we came, came home from my second deployment in 07, 08. But when we got back to Atlanta, as after we turned our weapons in, I went out to greet my family and Natalie and Mason. This picture is, well, I guess it's the second best. This is the front page. President Obama was in town. He was on page two. Yes. <laughs> so we beat the president. Yes. Any questions? Did I send the best care packages? <laughs> yes, I believe so. <laughs> My sister and Diane always had the best care packages. Well, Joe, thanks, man. An unbelievable round of applause for Joe. You can't let him get out of here without a little something, Joe. And, uh, awesome. Nice for you. Oh, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks again.